Welcome, welcome, and welcome, oh you geeky faithful of all shapes and sizes. I'm Sean Cronenfeld, and this is Unrepentant Geeking, the show on that guy with the glasses that's seen your true shadow and loves you anyways. On today's episode, we're going to be taking a look at the first three episodes of the latest animated offering in the Persona franchise, Persona 4 Gold in the Animation. I'll also be spotlighting the works of one Stefan Ganji, one of the best writers you've never heard of, But first, get your special glasses on and put that gun to your head, because it's time to dive into the world of Persona. First and foremost, it's important to understand that Persona 4 Gold in the animation, unlike its namesake, is not a remake of the original Persona 4 anime. It's a sequel. Indeed, if you've never played either Persona 4 the game, either version, or watched the P4 anime, then by episode 2 of Golden, you'll likely be completely and utterly lost. While the first episode of the show goes through the opening bits and bobs of the Persona 4 story, the remaining two episodes aired to date immediately jump forward in the timeline, throwing new characters at viewers with nary a word of explanation. Gold in the animation is not interested in catching up viewers on past events, and instead clearly operates under the assumption that anyone watching the show is already more than familiar with the particulars. And the reason for all this is because despite its title, Persona 4 Gold in the animation is really Marie's story through and through. For those unfamiliar with the character, Marie is a mysterious young woman who has no memories of her past and was included as an exclusive new character in the Vita remake of Persona 4 titled, of course, Persona 4 Golden. At the time, it was unclear just how canonical Marie's story really was, After all, the female version of the main character for Persona 3, introduced in its PSP remake, has since been firmly labeled as from an alternate universe by the Persona developers, and there was no reason to believe that the same might not end up being true for Marie as well. However, with the character showing up in upcoming titles such as Persona Q and Persona 4 Arena Ultimax, both of which have been explicitly confirmed as canon by the folks at Atlas, it would seem that Marie is indeed here to stay. This in turn answers the question of why an anime version of Persona 4 Golden was made in the first place. After all, Persona 4 The Animation was just released back in 2012, and it's far too soon for a remake, especially one that will be running only 13 episodes to that series 26. It's for these reasons that since it was announced, people have been questioning and even decrying the existence of gold in the animation, but I've long maintained that it was going to be exactly what it's turned out to be. Namely, a compilation of all the new sequences featured in Gold in the Game, with a particular focus on Marie. While I can't say for sure if this is true or not, I suspect this is being done at least in part so that one can get caught up on the character without having to play a game currently only available on a single system, and a fairly unpopular one, especially outside of Japan, at that. Indeed, while Episode 1 goes over half its running time without Marie being present, Episodes 2 and 3 of Golden are largely the Marie and Yu show, featuring the remaining cast of Persona 4 in more or less supporting roles. Which is not to say that Marie is the only character being given moments to shine, far from it, but even the slowest viewer should have, by the end of Episode 3, if not sooner, picked up on the fact that the show is using Marie's personal journey to frame everything that is occurring. Honestly, I suspect the only reason non-Marie-related moments were included in the first episode at all was so that the animators and writers could make one hell of a ballsy meta-joke. Said joke? 
that we are essentially watching a New Game Plus version of the opening portions of Persona 4. The episode is littered with clues to this fact that I'll leave for you to discover on your own, but I will say it is a gloriously cheeky idea that is very well executed. Of course, episodes 2 and 3 makes it clear that this idea should not be taken too literally. Yu is not simply reliving the events of Persona 4 Groundhog Day style or the like, for example. Instead, it's more conceit that lets the writers have some fun, while also making sure at least one full-on fight sequence occurs during the show's early episodes. Indeed, there's no combat or persona wielding in the subsequent two episodes of Golden whatsoever, and instead, the show firmly divides its focus between spot-on comedy and strong character work. Now, having played Golden, I feel confident in saying that this lack of action is not going to last forever. Indeed, the teaser for episode 4 hints at a return to the world inside the TV. But those looking for balls-to-the-wall action or a high-octane pace filled with constant plot developments would probably be better served looking elsewhere. Overall, if I had to sum up the first three episodes of Persona 4 Gold in the animation in a single word, elegant would be the descriptor I would use. Both the humor and the more heartfelt character moments in episodes 2 and 3 are very effective in my opinion, and the show does not just feel like the rote exercise it could have easily ended up becoming. Of course, I say that as a Persona fan of a pretty high order, and someone who really appreciated Marie's addition in Gold in the game as well, but then this is a show not really for non-Persona fans anyways. I don't mean this in some sort of snotty hipster kind of way. I'm just saying that this is a show not designed to stand on its own, and I don't think there's anything inherently wrong with this fact. That being said, I cannot stress enough that Gold in the Animation is just about the worst possible place for newcomers to the franchise to begin. Either play the original game, preferably its superior Vita version if possible, or watch the first anime before even considering giving this show a try, or risk being largely confused and lost the entire time as a result. For anyone who loved Persona 4, be it in game or animation form, Persona 4 Gold in the Animation is the perfect excuse to revisit old friends, while also getting prepared for the new Persona Adventures due out later this year. So, that's it for Persona 4 Gold in the Animation, and I intend to check back in with it for a follow-up review once the series has completed its run. Now, however, it's time for a new segment of the show that I hope to be making a regular feature going forward. Basically, these spotlights will be a chance for me to highlight and draw attention to works of all mediums that I feel deserve a spot in the sun. Some will be fairly obscure, while others perhaps less so, and I'm planning to cover everything from TV shows to webcomics to podcasts to artists to novels and more. For what it's worth, I don't consider these actual full reviews, and indeed, I freely retain the right to gush a little here and there when necessary. And with that out of the way, we'll be starting things off with a favorite creator of mine that I've been following since 1997, if you can believe it. God, I feel old sometimes. If you were big into both anime and that melting pot of horror and wonder known as fanfiction back in the late 90s and early aughts, the chances are good you would have at least heard of a writer by the pen name Two Flower. Known best for his trilogy of Slayers fanfiction, Two Flower in real life is a man by the name of Stefan Ganji, and at the time he was one of the most respected voices working in all of fanfiction. Eventually Stefan would leave the world of fanfics behind, but he's never stopped writing, and in the intervening years, he's built up an impressive body of work that includes Unreal Estate, a, and I quote, sci-fi action comedy reality-bending love story with a twist, telling an epic story of a unique multiverse. And Sailor Nothing, an original novel that in Stefan's own words, shows how being a sailor-suited warrior of love and justice is one of the most miserable, thankless, dangerous, and emotionally crippling jobs ever. Now keep in mind, he wrote Sailor Nothing back in 2002, nearly 10 years before the popular Madoka Magica series would explore similar themes. Stefan tends to produce works that certainly draw their inspiration from anime, but that's hardly his only influence. And indeed, more than anything, the stories of Stefan Ganji tend to bend and blend genres to produce something wholly unique and original. Among his other major inspirations are the works of Terry Pratchett. And much like Pratchett's Discworld novels, Stefan excels at mixing humor with larger and more thought-provoking ideas and themes. He can also write a mean action scene, but of all his many talents, it's his ability to create fully developed characters and worlds that's always stood out the most for me. Stefan is not in fact a full-time writer, and like so many of his colleagues has a day job, and by choice he remains firmly in the realm of self-publication as well. For years that simply meant posting his works online, but with his two most recent projects he's taken the step of publishing retail versions, both digitally and physically, and even going so far as to run a successful Kickstarter to help with the latter. 
And it's those two projects that I want to draw a special attention to in a two-part spotlight that will continue in the next episode of Unrepentant Geeking. Today, however, I want to highlight Anachronauts, a web novel series of broomsticks, semi-automatics, and jetpacks, and which includes four novels and one collection of shorter side stories. Anachronauts takes place in the aftermath of a cataclysmic occurrence called the Pandora Event, which saw elements and peoples from dozens of different worlds and universes transported to every part of our planet without warning or explanation in the late 21st century. Everything from fairies, trolls, and other creatures of fae, to aliens who now live in invisible spaceship cities in orbit, to stranger and more esoteric creatures straight out of a certain popular mythos, were brought over. And as you can imagine, the impact this had on the socio-political structure of the day was less than ideal. As the series begins, 200 years has passed, and we focus on what was once the United States of America. During the first 100 years, a war was fought between the United States and the fae courts of winter and summer, that eventually ended with the fae taking over much of the southeast East portion of the country, while the U.S. government retreated back to the Northeast and behind massive walls armed to the teeth with guns and a variety of other weapons that go boom. In the intervening century, a fierce Cold War has existed between the two sides, with many small, unaffiliated communities in the Midwest, some who use science, some who use magic, and some who revert back to an almost 19th century style of life, caught in the middle. And as for the North and Southwest... Well, contact was lost out there shortly following the Pandora event, with faint rumors coming through of something truly, unimaginably horrible occurring. These days, nobody is sure who or what remains. Finally, overseas, technology from a world driven by steam has allowed Britain to become a dominant empire once again, and they now rule the entirety of Europe and much of Africa with a firm and iron grasp. Contact between the various portions of the globe is rare thanks to a lack of resources making air travel no longer practical and the oceans becoming filled with countless beings of myth such as Kraken, Merman, and more who make water travel perilous at best and impossible at worst. Into this volatile setup wanders three unique individuals, two girls and one boy, a witch, an alien, and a former U.S. soldier recruited in his teens all just entering their 20s and all setting out into the larger world for reasons of their own. Fate brings them together, and what starts out as a simple journey will soon have ramifications that will affect all of Earth and beyond. Anachronauts is a work of immense creativity and originality. It's the kind of series where elves can take over Cape Canaveral in order to form their own space program, and a witch can be the most down-to-earth and practical person of all. The series is humor, action, tragedy, drama, and so much more, and I cannot recommend it enough This series certainly has a setup that sounds very anime-like at first glance, but you don't have to love that particular medium to enjoy Anachronauts. Frankly, I could go on and on about why I love this series so much, but I think I'll let the work speak for itself instead, and read for you all the opening sequence of the first Anachronauts novel. And that's going to wrap up things for this episode of Unrepentant Geeking. Next time, we'll focus on Stefan Gagne's current web novel project, City of Angles. And no, I did not mean to say angels. In the meantime, come back next Tuesday for another episode of Blistered Reviews, where I'll be taking a look at three recent indie releases, including the much-anticipated remake Oddworld, New and Tasty. Until then, for Unrepentant Geeking and That Guy with the Glasses, I'm Sean Cronenfeld, wishing you all happy geeking.